What's going on Reef Builders? Jake Adams here and it's been such an amazing year uh, working to put together another reef show. This is the first year we've done a second reef aquarium show, another version of reef stock. And uh, after doing it 10 years in Denver, we took it to Australia and uh, really am just amazed to have over 2,000 reefers come to our uh, conferences uh, in Denver and Australia combined. And uh, we got to see a lot of great corals, a lot of cool people, and some awesome presentations like this one from Vincent Chalius, which is probably one of the most practical talks that you can actually see anywhere on corals in the wild, especially from an aquarist perspective. So um, Vincent Chalius knows more about wild corals than anybody. He's one of the uh, pioneers of coral farming. And uh, if he doesn't know about a coral in the wild of, of Indonesia. Um, I don't know who does. So um, I know this talk was very well received. I hope you guys enjoy it too. Thanks to everybody that came out to Reefstock and uh, be sure to keep it locked on reefstock.show as we'll be announcing the dates for next year's uh, Reefstocks very soon. So uh, thanks again to everybody that came to Reefstock and I'll see you guys again very soon. I saw this soccer Blues last year and it was so incredible. I'm like, we're gonna fly you all the way from Bali, Indonesia. I didn't mention that. This guy came from the other side of the world just to be here. We bring the best. Please help me in welcoming Vincent Chalice. Thank you very much. Thank you for thank you, Jake, for the intro. Thank you for flying me here. I enjoy it. I love I love Denver. Denver is a very nice city, and I'm happy to be here and talk to you a little bit about what I do in, in Bali. So just to give you a little bit an idea of what I'm doing, um, so I do the same thing as you, except that instead of doing it in an aquarium, I do it in the ocean. And I have several farms all around the island in different ecosystems, so what I do is you change light, I change depth. You change a power head, I take a coral and I put it in more current. And I change environment, so I always play with the different environments of the coral. So I, so I, I move corals around, and then I need to know why certain corals don't go well in one place, and why they do well in another place. Uh, there is one thing that I'm sure is, if a coral grows in a certain place, there is a reason for it. You just can't take a coral and move it around, you know, and in different lighting, different, and it will do well. It's not like that. Every coral is very well adapted to the environment. So that's why I like to remind hobbyists because they have a, um, a certain view of the reef which is not actually exactly what it is really. They imagine the reef with crystal clear water. It's not actually what it is. Uh, when people want to make underwater photography for wide angle, they wait for certain conditions. They need to have perfect visibility, perfect condition, and then they take a picture. But it's only happened a few days a year. All the rest of the year, the, coral, the corals go through different stresses. So this is what we're going to do, you know. Uh, the, the, the first thing is why coral transform from white coral to aquarium corals. Um, artificial lighting is obviously, you know, the, the most important factor. Uh, sunlight is not blue. Um, and even though you go 90 feet down there, it's not as blue, it's not white or blue there is still some white light that goes through, you know. So the lighting is different and it's growing apart from natural lighting. Uh, there is no such a thing as enough flow. Uh, some places where I grow calls, we always look for, especially for Acropora, we always look for a lot of flow. Because a lot of flow will mean less algae, less predator, and cleaner and easier to maintain farms. Most of the Aquarium, the corals in the ocean, they feed a lot. And unfortunately, until now, I don't think there is enough feeding for corals in aquariums. The aquariums are too clean. They, in the ocean, they get food and they get light. In an aquarium, they only get light and very little food. Water parameters are much more stable in an aquarium. Uh, I will explain this a little bit later. Uh, the sea conditions are always changing, so temperature, many parameters fluctuate a lot during the day, during the, the year. The last thing is uh, corals in aquarium, they only grow. They don't reproduce sexually, you know, so they, all their orientation is to be fragged, grow, be fragged, 
grow, we try, we grow, they don't produce gonads, except for this thing. <laughs> <laughs> so all the energy is used for growth, and nothing is used for producing eggs. So this story of uh, parametrics, turbidity. So I told many people the last two days, two weeks ago I was in Java, and in my farm, if I put my arm like this, I cannot see my hand. So visibility fluctuates, it's rainy season right now, where I come from, so when it's raining a lot, obviously the visibility goes very, very low. In Indonesia, when we get 30 feet visibility, we are very happy. Full intake, uh, depending on the season, you have fish spawning, coral spawning, you have blooms of algae, you have blooms of uh, zooplankton, and of course, yeah, they are adapted to catch many different kinds of food, and they have a lot of food available. I check the, the cycles of algae, uh, because of course, you know, when algae overgrow our racks, we have to go and clean everything. So um, it's, it's it's a fight, it's a war that we cannot win because. It's like uh, grape algae, like colerpa, we find only during dry season. So during two, three months a year, it's growing everywhere, then it disappears. Then you have algae, alulva taking up, then two, three months later, another algae taking over and taking over. So you have many cycles of algae. There is one thing that people also don't understand, that there is many different kind of environment for corals. They don't come from the same habitat. They have many different habitats. So you would take inshore reef, that would be calm water, very turbid. This is where actually most of the corals come from. Uh, you would have offshore reef, big swells, big waves, clear water, sometimes upwelling, so cool and high uh, minerals. Uh, deep water reef, like the one on the picture below, where you have mostly coral feeding, you know, this is black coral, sponges, crinoids, and uh, LPS coral. That would take a lot of food. Uh, lagoon, so the species that live in the lagoon are adapted to all this change in tides and temperature. And an aquarium actually can only represent one environment. So all the corals have to adapt to this particular environment. And not all corals can adapt to offshore reef conditions. Because I think most of the reef that people are trying to make is offshore reef. I just show you an example. Acropora fluorescence. So this is one coral. We've been growing it for almost 20 years. It's, there are many all around Bali we can find it, but different, depending on the location we find it, it will grow differently. So um, this one is the most common, the most sought after <coughs> form. It lives in very strong flow, surge, very strong surge, medium and high glide. So it's usually a bit thick, very dense, and uh, it lives in very shallow water in places where there is huge current. If there is a little bit less current, almost no surge, the same light, it will grow thinner and start to branch out a little bit. If it goes in a place where the flow is less, but there is still a little bit of surge, it needs to absorb the energy of the surge, so it will make some holes inside the colony. And finally, if it lives in a place where there is not not so much flow and good lighting, you will branch out. So, actually it took me years, you know, to understand that this was the same species. Um, um, it's just, the color morphology are always the same, so you always find it in purple tips. But sometimes, every 10 species, you find one nice green metallic. And this is by finding those green metallic ones that I found out that it was actually the same species. So like, like the one at the bottom corner, I know here they call it Acropora solitariensis, but it's not. It's, it's just a form of efflosion. So this coral, depending on where I'm going to culture it, I'm going to have different forms. So I need to find the right environment where I can get the what people want. So the meat of crystal, crystal clear water. So I was saying this before. <laughs> 90% of reef have visibility of less than 40 feet, 45 feet. Uh, to take those pictures, I have to wait very good conditions. And uh, if the conditions are not good, I just cannot take these pictures. It just would be milky. So reef of Hawaii, Kwajalein, Maldives are not really representative of most coral habitats. You have to understand that, like Indonesia or Australia, there is land, land mass, so there is rivers, there is rain, 
there is a lot of sediment which are discharged in the, in the water and so this affects the turbidity of the reefs so all the, all <coughs> the corals and most of the corals are coming from actually turbid environment in Australia if you want to get to clear water they need to go out 10 or 15 or 50 miles if they just stay by the shore they will get only turbid reefs uh, so what I think is most of the corals that you find in turbid water are actually strong, stronger than the one you find on, on clear water. So reef aquarium is actually based on the very subjected image of our reef. Perception that people have that the water is so clear, you can see through, everything there is no nutrient, you need to get zero phosphate, zero nitrates. No. <laughs> no. no. It's you have to handle it. If you have uh, very low nutrients and very low of everything, it's not going to work. But you can have, is a good example, you know, he has very high nutrients and very high alkalinity and everything is fine. So uh, this, this myth of very low nutrient, it's not such a thing. And if I look at um, like zero vid corals, for me they are stressed or they are bleached corals. So when you put them in an environment where there is no food to feed those antenna, they just lose them. Okay, they're nice, they're colorful, you know, but they're stressed. If you make another small mistake, they're gone. So those corals that come from very rich water, they actually have to adapt to this kind of very low nutrients uh, water and this special light and this low current. Okay, so uh, uh, just to give you some few examples of uh, uh, some few corals that actually adapted very well to aquarium conditions. Uh, so, why we collect in turbid habitat? Because they are closer to the shore, easy to access, often the conditions are better, except the visibility, there is not so much wave, so it's easier to, to go and dive. Uh, the corals usually, because they see less light, they have less pigment, so they usually a little bit less colorful. But their feeding aspect is, is increased because there is a lot of food in the water. There is more nutrient for those antenna, so there is more those antenna, so they are more grown. And it's the easiest environment for them to colonize because in a place where there is a lot of surge, a lot of current, it's difficult for larvae to settle properly. But in a place where there is a lot of food, there is space to settle, not too much current, and it's easier for them. So, it's a place where, uh, after bleaching, it's quickly colonized by the corals. And it's often the place where there is the highest diversity. You know, if you go, like in Australia, they find the, the scolimia only in turbid environment, and there is many species that actually adapted to, to this kind of environment. So the diversity is always high. And the corals, they can adapt to different conditions. So I just made a small video of uh, some conditions just to give you an idea. It's a little bit red, but you can see all the particles in the water. This is what the reef, it, this is pretty good condition. You probably have, mm, I would say, 20, 25 feet visibility. You know? So it's, it's what it really looks like. And when there's a lot of food, there's very turbid water, there's a lot of fish. So this is another reef that's in North Bali. It is colonized by uh, soft corals. So, same thing, a lot of soft corals, a lot of food, a lot of fish. And then, after, that's Poitus cylindrica. This is a, a coral which is very, you find it in places which have high nutrients. So, you see them very often. Okay, so I'm always asked if uh, I see this often, you know, people think that we can take aquarium corals and put them back in the ocean and use them to receive the ocean. I don't think so. Uh, first of all, you know, they're not adapted anymore to the light, to sunlight, so they will probably bleach. Uh, they're not adapted to the, to the flow, 
they need to have a denser skeleton, they don't have the water quality, unable to feed because they lost their digestive organs, they lost their, their um, stinging cells. The pigment composition is unbalanced, so they will get harmed by UV. Um, it's a selection, you have to understand that in the ocean, you know, there is corals which are fit for aquariums. They are only 1% of the corals. The coral reef is brown. And then there is one piece here, one piece there, one piece here, one piece there, which are colorful and then we can collect it. You know? So it's actually aquarium corals are a very small selection of natural corals. It's only 1% of what you can find. So their DNA is pretty weak because they don't have so much variation, so much diversity. They will need to be reacclimated to ocean conditions. But their larvae could be used to insect ocean. So if we can breed them, like him, we could use those larvae one day. Um, that's aquarium corals. So for me, aquarium corals are like the goldfish. Um, the freshwater goldfish, you know, was a small fish, brown color, not very nice, and then they made it become red and, and white and bubble eyes and you name it. All kind of color and all kind of shape and everything. This is what aquarium corals are becoming. Uh, designer clownfish. There is no designer clownfish in the ocean. <laughs> Bones mushroom. You can find some mushroom with a little bit bigger vesicles. But this mushroom will get eaten by a butterfly fish in no time. So it can't survive, it's not fit to survive in the ocean. Designer acros, as I say, you know, they've been cooked to become designer acros. They're not fit for the reef anymore. Designer chalices, chalices are from a very deep, very low light environment. So they react and produce a lot of pigment in aquarium because they are exposed to a lot more light than what it used to. Uh, crafted corals. Crafted coral, it's coming from one poly. You have one wall on Montipora, then you look for, and there is one poly, but it's different coral. You find this poly, you cut it out, you frag it, you propagate it. So, but this is just one DNA problem on one huge coral. Okay, so um, what I like about frags is that actually this is the most colorful part of the coral. Why is that? Because those antella are brown and they are lacking in the tips. The coral is growing, the brown antella didn't get enough time to go up the, the branch. The tips are the most exposed to UV light, so that's why they produce a lot of more pigments. Um, on the right side, you can see it's actually the same, the same species. You know, the frag on the right, the bottom right, is the same species. This is a valley short cane, corporal, latistella. This is a very small colony with just tips, that's why it is this picture. So the tips produce the pigment before being colonized by the zoantella. The calcification uses up all the energy and produces a lot of toxic waste. That's why the zoantella cannot go up the tips. So quarter inch frags is actually more colorful than a fully grown colony. You know? mm -hmm. So every time you buy a frag, you actually buy the most colorful part of the coral. So that's why it's a good business. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to give you some few examples, you know, of um, species, what they look like in the ocean, you know, and what they become in a coin. So um, this Acropora cardus, red dragon. This is what is called in the aquarium. Me, I call it brown wing. <laughs> so in the, in the ocean, it's, you find them on slopes, turbid water, calm base, and then you just invade the slope from 10 foot until 30, 50, 60 feet. Uh, they just brown, just basically brown. A little bit of pinkish things. The skeleton is very brittle, very thin. If you just step on them, just touch them a little bit, they break off. Actually, this is their strategy because they propagate by asexual reproduction. They just wait to be broken off by a, by a storm or anything and just go down the slope and keep going from one. In aquarium, it becomes intense red. Uh, the skeleton becomes thicker and longer. 
and becomes a red dragon. This one is another example. You know, it's pretty famous in Denver because one guy named Hermock built this one of these very nice colonies in this tank before he passed away. So the one named Hermock. This this one is a bit the same. In the ocean, large patches, pretty much brown with yellow tips, very thin and brittle skeleton, and same thing, propagated by asexual reproduction. You know. it breaks off and then another colony comes out, comes out. Forms big fields. And under aquarium, you can see, you know, it becomes very intensely colorful. You know. it's, it's actually gorgeous. Uh, it becomes very bright red with very nice yellow bright uh, polyps. The skeleton here again become thicker and longer. And they don't go as long as they go in the ocean. Body shortcake, this is another one. Uh, same thing, live in murky, uh, shallow bays, not too much current, and drop off and ledge. Um, skeleton is very fragile. Uh, different color, blue tips on axial coralite, uh, yellow tips on uh, radial coralite, and then the pink, brownish bays. This one prioritizes on uh, sexual reproduction because it's only from small colonies, everywhere, and spawn and uh, propagate. In aquarium, the red becomes very intense, the blue becomes very intense. It's actually a very nice color, and I see a lot of them. If I go up there, if I go and check in all the, the tanks, I see a lot of this. Uh, Acropora finirae. Uh, I, I like this one because it's, uh, it lives in very particular habitat. It lives in, at the bottom of silky, muddy trees. At pretty deep, like 60, 60 feet, forms huge colonies. It's very fragile. Um, you only find one large colony once in a while. In aquarium, it becomes very intensely bright blue with, with green tips. It's a very nice color. Makes only small colonies in the aquarium, unfortunately. This one is a popular one. At the moment, all the cards from Australia, so the shortcake, um, all those pink floyd, pink lemonade, pink flamingo, there's many color variations of it. Same days. We, we will culture microclados for the next 20 years for sure. Because there is so many different color variations that it's going to become popular one after another one. Another one. So you're going to hear about this one. Uh, this one lives in places with a lot of current, uh, offshore conditions. Uh, it makes pretty big colonies most of the of the environment. That's why the strawberry shortcake are always work on a piece of, of large colonies. It's very difficult to find a small one. Uh, in shallow water, when you find them in very shallow water, the colors are just <coughs> intense, so intense. In aquarium they are a little bit harder to keep, but they start to plates, make thinner branches, longer polyps, longer tentacles. A bit hard to keep. Uh, the color properly as you can find in the ocean. Acropora exquisita, this is one um, uh, shallow water, turbid habitat. It's not so nice in the ocean, I mean, it's bluish, greenish. But um, what we do, so we culture in the north, where the water is very calm and turbid, and once they reach a certain size, we move them to the south, where they go in a, in a place where there is more current, there is upwelling, the water is cooler, clearer, and then it changes colorations. So uh, from light blue it becomes darker, and then you start to get the green tips. So what you do in aquarium, I do it in the ocean. Uh, in aquarium the skeleton becomes very fragile, and um, the tips become really green, it's beautiful in the aquarium. Acropoatenuis, hey. For me, it's the most boring call. Because <laughs> that's all I hear about all day long. Everybody, tennis, 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 tennis. That's all. <laughs> this is Walt Disney, this is Homebreaker, you name it. So many thousand names. 15 years ago, we would grow them under metalalite, they would go just fine. They would become intensely blue, intensely green. Okay, with LEDs, they, they start to get these weird colorations that we don't see in the ocean. So, 
most of the time I can see, you know, when I, see, I look at the home breaker, like this small picture, I see where it's coming from. I have some of my cohorts, they have the green inside, they have the red, and they have the blue tips. And I know if I cook them for a few weeks under blue and blue, they will probably become home breaker. Um, so yeah. It's probably the species that I, I produce the most at the moment because the demand is so, so high. So it lives in protected murky bays. Sometimes you find them in offshore reefs, you know, where they don't get too much swell. Um, there is a broad spectrum of coloration from blue tips to red to green and with different variations. Um, so those also, you know, we grow them in the north and we bring them in shallow clear water in the slouse just to intensify the coloration. Um, when we do that, because there is more current, they become more compact, uh, the skeleton become harder, they grow slower. The aquarium is a very easy coral, very forgiving corals. It's, it's been around for so many time, for so many years, and I think we will hear about it for the next 20 years again. Uh, and then, yeah, because it develops, it reacts to different lighting differently, you know, so we have all those strains, crazy strains, like, yeah, those orange, pinkies, what this name. Also, when they, in aquarium, they always become furry, you know, the tentacle will always extend during the day. If you go in the ocean, you know, there's no such a thing, you know. They only extend their tentacle at night. So, for me, that's the moral of the story. It's, it's, it's better to buy a good old brown acro that will have a chance to adapt and develop nice colorful color than a crazy colorful acro you know that will come out. <laughs> it's also much cheaper. <laughs> but yeah, it's 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 the thing, you know, I mean the turbid corals are not very colorful, you know, but they adapt very well and they produce intense coloration under specific lighting. So if you want to have amazing corals, it's better you use warm one to start with. That's another uh, example of, uh, of a coral that we play around with. So I hope you in mind, you know, it lives in the same thing, you know, shallow, murky bay. Uh, it's, you can see the, the, the photo on the top, it's blue. It's nice, it's a nice blue, you can see from far away in the ocean, you know, it's nice blue. But then, you move it to shallow water, to same thing, clear, clear water, clear shallow water, and then it becomes intense, intense purple. You can see at the photo of the back, you can, it's not very clear, you know, but the, the, the coral lights become green. There is a drawback to it, I will tell you just after that. In aquarium, it's stick. This coloration, deep purple. It's a nice and with a little bit green poly. It's a very beautiful color. Small video, you know, so you can see, you know, in it. it's all brown. And then there is this, this in the middle. This is what actually a coral reef looks like, you know. Brown corals with a nice piece in the middle. Uh, it's very light blue, you know, it's much, much stronger purple in the coin. Uh, so, what we do, uh, so we grow them in the north, in shallow water. The skeleton is very weak and coarse. And then, because of change of current and change of feeding strategy, the classification change, and uh, the, the skeleton becomes more dense, the branch shorter, there is more light, so they change uh, coloration, they become more deep purple. It's pretty obvious the difference of coloration is in the colony shape changes, the branch becomes shorter, more branching. If in the north, you just go one single branch forever, which is not very nice for anyone to sell them. Uh, there is one drawback, that's the drawback. Uh, when you change environment, you take some risk. And uh, like this species, it's actually adapted to very weak current because it's most of the time always colonized by ostrobium. Ostrobium is one algae that grows inside the skeleton and just go up the skeleton. The coral grows, the skeleton becomes weak with the algae inside, breaks off, the corals just propagate. When you change to a different environment, it's still colonized by the ostrobium. The skeleton becomes denser and the, and the growth is much slower. So what happens is the ostrobium, you know, 
keep on going up inside the skeleton and actually end up killing the corals. So uh, we move them, we keep them just two or three weeks, we color them, and then we sell them. But if we leave them there, like over a month, they will die. Because they are just not adapted to this environment. Millis, I love Millis. This is probably the, one of the most beautiful aquariums. Uh, but in aquarium, for me, I never get what it really looks like in the ocean. So you can see them from far away, you know, because they are so intense. The coloration is so intense that you can see them from 30 feet away, you can spot it. It lives in shallow, murky bays. It makes these big, huge colonies. You find all kinds of coloration, you know, purple, blue, red, green, orange, you name it, different tentacle coloration, different tips coloration, so many variations possible. Uh, when I observe them, I always notice that uh, the tentacles in the, in the colony are very long, but to the tips, there is not that many tentacles. You know. It took me years to understand, you know, the, the, the way they function, you know. It's, uh, this coral has a very high metabolism. Because it lives in very shallow water, so obviously it gets a lot of light. That's not, that's not all. This, this, this colony shape is actually a perfect food trap. It's made for to slow down the flow and get the particles to fall down in the center of the colony. You know? And this is where you have all those tentacles and all those feeding polyps. So it's one coral that is not forgiving. It ships, it doesn't ship well, doesn't go very well in aquarium, it's very sensitive, it bleaches very easily. And that, the reason why is because the metabolism needs to get a lot of food and needs to get a lot of light. And unfortunately, it's very difficult to achieve this result in aquarium. Uh, so it, the correlation is hard to keep. They get, it's, I mean, they get, we should show you some example, you know. It gets longer tentacle in some current, lose the, the, the nice current both shape, branch get thinner. So this is what they look like when I culture them. Uh, it's very easy for me in the ocean to get a very small colony that already have a natural shape. So, like those one, the, the red one with blue tips, is still a bit small, but two months later I will have the shape, same thing as the one above. Uh, a, a small colony of two inch already have a perfect coral shape. But in aquarium, this is what they look like. Weird shape. Branches going in all directions. The coloration is alright, but it doesn't look anything like uh, what it looks like in the ocean. After there is all those species of corals which are beautiful in the ocean, but unfortunately you cannot keep them in aquarium as coral food. So they are challenges. So Acropora digitifera is probably the most intense, intense coloric coral that I know. You can see it from, you can spot it. You can see, you know, it's glowing. But you collect it. You just bring up the surface and it's already losing color. So it lives in Project and Murky Bay also. Very bright, very bright coloration. And I can get it in purple, in red, in green, in many different colorations with different color food tips. With aquarium, it's very seldom that I see a colony which is actually nice. So it's probably the worst possible aquarium candidates. But it's a good challenge. Another challenge would be Acropora humilis, because, of course, it lives in offshore reef crest, so it needs a lot of surge, a lot of current, probably a lot of food too. Uh, the lightning needs to be very, very intense. So I have those colonies that everybody, every time I post a picture of this, they go crazy about it, you know, it's red, with green tips. It's actually beautiful, but they can't get them. They can't get them to stay colorful. So it's another one which is not a very good aquarium candidate. So, what is it? It's a um, tremendous amount of light that you find in very shallow, very clear water reefs. Tremendous amount of flow. I think, I mean, there is no one aquarium that has enough flow. You can buy some pumps and buy some pumps and buy some pumps. A copper needs a lot, a lot of flow. Crystal clear water, very stable parameters. Very low of everything on the reef crest. The water is more more clear and of course there is less nutrient and there is less food for the corals. So it's where so called thrive. So because they can resist wave and surge and there is a lot of food and 
bunch of current, they are very well adapted to catching food in the current. So this is where you find a lot of subcurrents. So this is a small video of uh, what a reef crest looks like. And uh, there is still a lot of work I think to get this kind of things in the point. And you will see there is always soft corals, you know, hanging around mm -hmm. everywhere in between. The coral, some Sinulaya, some Sarcophyton. This is what the reef look like. I wish aquariums would look like a little bit more like that. Yeah, that's big. That's big and old. Yeah. So, yeah, so what does it take to achieve these results? Uh, what do we miss? What do we lack? So, artificial lighting should be closer to natural lighting. There is still a lot of things to work on the, on the lighting in order to get light that stresses the coral so it develops nice colors but also that is able to keep, hard to keep colors. New water flow system, we need to work on water movement. Feeding is one thing that we need to work on. Uh, feeding and uh, not putting the water. More stable parameters with natural variations, you know, like moon, like water flow depending on the tides, like uh, nutrients, increased nutrients at certain time of the year. You can lower the sanity a little bit and put a little bit more nutrients. More competition, uh, to put one species in one system, you know, doesn't work. I like to mix up my corals or my racks. They grow faster, they develop different coloration. So they are put into competition and I think the tank should be like that. Uh, and then work on sexual reproduction. Um, this is the goal we should all try to achieve in aquarium. So we should find a more natural approach or develop a more deviant approach that in order to be able to keep all the different corals, not only few, just all the corals. That's it. If you have any questions.